Okay, we covered the first two chapters, and now we're going to go into chapter three. Your first two chapters basically were more or less introduction. And now we're going to talk about chapter three, home ownership concepts, different concepts, and gets more into the meats and potatoes we're starting into. So what does that mean to you? More definitions to remember. Definitions, repeat, repeat, repeat. The more you hear it, the more you read it, the more you see it, the more you'll remember it. So now we're going to talk about different types of housing. Is there more than one type of housing? Of course. You have an apartment complex. Some of you may live in an apartment complex. It's a group of apartment buildings that could have a four units, six units, 25 units, whatever. Condominium, that's ownership, share of ownership of common facilities. It's managed and maintenance. You have a management and the maintenance of the exteriors are handled by basically the association, outside contractors, and with condominium ownership, you usually pay a monthly association fee. And the owners of the condominium usually own from the paint on in. Whatever's from your paint on in. You own airspace most times. Another type we're going to talk about, it's similar to a condominium, but it might be confusing to you. It's a cooperative. There are many cooperatives throughout the state of Illinois. There's units that share common walls and facilities. It seems like it's like a condominium but you do not own real property. The owners buy shares of stock in the corporation. The corporation holds the title to the building. Owners of the corporation that own the building receive a proprietary lease that entitles you to occupy the particular unit you live in. So owners of co cooperatives, they don't own any real estate. They basically own shares of stock, which are personal property. Next one we're going to talk about is a planned unit development, also known as a PUD, or master plan community. It merges residential, recreational, commercial, all into one development. Many PUDs are under special zoning ordinances. You see many senior communities. You go out to Huntley, there's a senior community out there, and they have everything. That's a PUD. Some subdivisions are under PUDs, some residential subdivisions, and some townhomes, etc. Many of your newer subdivisions throughout the suburbs of Illinois are known as PUDs. You may have a small association fee to pay for the community areas, maybe for the grass, the maintenance, you know, for the sign entering into your subdivision. You may have a clubhouse, you may have a pool, etc. Retirement communities, they're structured as PUDs. As I said before, they may provide shopping, recreational opportunities, healthcare facilities. They have everything in there. They don't have to go anywhere. Then you go downtown Chicago, you have high-rise developments. And they're called at times mixed-use developments, also known as MUDs. What's mixed unit development? Well, it combines office and store space and theaters down there on the first few floors, and then maybe residential condos up here or apartment buildings. They're usually self-contained. So if you have a building up on the upper floor, that's residential. Down here, it's commercial. It's a mud. It's mixed use development. And then converted use properties. Again, I'm going to revert back to the Chicago area or some areas where they converted property. Something that was a factory 20 years ago, you may be living in today. Why? Because they've converted it to residential use properties or other use. You could have had a factory now reverted into a school or a ho hotel now reverted into an office building. That's converted use properties. They convert the use to something different. Manufactured housing. One time they were considered temporary residents, and they're often permanent residents or statutory vacation homes in housing parks. Okay, they're manufactured. We talked about that. They could be permanently attached, or they may be semi-permanent foundations. Well, if they're not permanently attached, they would be personal property. We talked about that. Most mobile homes are considered personal property in Illinois unless they're permanently attached to the foundation. Can't go and move it. Modular homes, as I told you earlier, they're pre-assembled at the factory. They're driven to the site. 
They had the kitchen cabinets. They had the toilet, and they have everything, the light fixtures. And then on the site, the, late, the workers basically finish the construction. They connect it, and they do the plumbing, the wiring, and it's permanently in the foundation, and it's a modular home. It's a prefab home. And those are real property, unless you can pick it up and move it. My brother's home, I, they couldn't pick it up and move. But when I sat in the living room, I could see this beam down the living room. That's where the two parts of the home got put together. Scary if it's a windstorm, right? Timeshares. Many of you may have a timeshare. It allows multiple purchasers, like you, to share ownership in a single property. It entitles you to the use of the property for a certain period of time each year. And when we talk about timeshares, you will talk, we'll talk later on about timeshare use and timeshare estate. The use is basically the right to use the property only. The estate is when you have an interest in the property. Something to remember and we'll talk about down the road. Next thing is housing affordability. How do you know? How does the lender know how much you can afford? Should you know how much your buyer can't afford? You should have some basic idea. Even though we do have the lend, we have them talk to the lenders to make sure they're pre-approved, pre-qualified, etc. But you, as a real estate professional, would want to have some form of idea how to get there. So how do we get there? Well, today there's creative mortgage loan programs being offered by various government agencies and private lenders. Some offer lower closing costs, deferred interest, principal payment. Some are targeted for first-time home buyers only, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to be learning about all different types of mortgage terms down the road in chapters 15 and 16. But how do you know how much you can afford? As a rule of thumb, the monthly cost of a mortgage debt is known as your principal, interest, taxes, and insurance, all four, plus if you're paying any association fee, that's included. So it would be principal, interest, taxes, and insurance, plus any association fee. It should not exceed 28% of the gross monthly income. Gross is before Uncle Sam comes and takes your taxes out. Okay, so sit down and figure, what's your gross monthly income? Where is your mortgage payment at, right? Does that, is it more than 28%? Well, when the market was very, very good years ago, well, I used to say almost anybody could get a mortgage loan, but now they're back to ratios many times. So your mortgage debt is principal, interest, taxes, insurance, and the association fee should not exceed 28% of the gross monthly income. And payments on, payments on all monthly reoccurring debts should not exceed 36%, such as Visa, MasterCard, American Express, Car Payment 1, Car Payment 2, Student Loan, Alimony, Child Support. Wow. Does that become more than 8% of your income? Because your housing cannot exceed 28, then your housing and monthly debts cannot exceed 36%. Wow. They don't count routine medical care. They're not counting car insurance, homeowner's insurance, your cell bill right now. They don't include those or your utilities. But just think, what are your monthly expenses? Should you get them down a little bit maybe before you go to purchase a home? So let's take a look at an example. Let's take a look at a gross yearly income. Let's say you have a gross income annually of 96000 Do you bring home 96000 No, but they calculate your qualifications based on your gross. So if you take your gross yearly income, we have to divide that by 12, correct, to come down to your gross monthly income? So we're going to take 96000 and we're going to divide it by 12. 12 to come to your monthly, which gives us 8000 a month. So knowing, based on your previous slide, your housing expense cannot exceed 28% of that 8000 So in your calculator, I want you to do a little simple math. Put in your calculator 8000 multiply it by 28, and hit your percent sign. You should now have $2,240. So your maximum housing expense, principal, interest, taxes, insurance, and any association fee should not exceed $2,240 per month. Maybe you don't want to pay that much. And then your maximum total debt, again, put in $8,000 into your calculator. 
and times it by 36 and hit the percent sign. Your maximum total debt, including your PITI and all your monthly debts, should not exceed $2,880 per month, which means your maximum monthly reoccurring debts should not exceed $640. Now, how many of you have more than $640 per month you pay out in credit cards, car payments, etc., etc.? Well, that will reduce how much of a house you can buy. So keep that in mind, and it's good to know that. Another investment consideration when you purchase property is going to be gain. That's what are you going to gain by owning real estate? Do you gain anything by renting an apartment? Yeah, one thing you gain is a bunch of rent receipts, right? But does a homeowner gain anything by renting an apartment? Or if they bought a house 10 years ago, 15 years ago, have they built up what they call equity? If you bought a piece of property 10 years ago for 100000 and today it's worth, let's say, even with the market going bad back a few years back, if you bought a house for 100000 what about if the value today is worth $140,000? let us say you put $20,000 down. Okay, so your mortgage loan was 80000 Well, your equity, that's the market value, less any debt. Your PITI, what you mortgaged. That's equity, okay? As time goes on, you basically, hopefully, your property will increase, increase, increase. And if you're living in an apartment or a potential buyer is living in an apartment, all that's going to increase is their rent payments. It's going to go up and up and up. But if you own an apartment building, you're going to build equity. So it's equity. It's a market value less anything that's owed on the property. When you own real estate, you have tax benefits. If it's your principal resident, you have tax benefit. The federal tax co code excludes 250000 of in capital gains on the sale of your principal residence. And that can be used over and over and over and over again. Now, if you happen to be married and you file taxes jointly, you would be eligible for five, up to 500,000 exemption. It can be used repeatedly, 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 but one thing you have to remember is as long as the homeowner occupied that property as their principal residence for two out of the last five years, you can use this tax benefit. If you only own that home for a year and a half and you want to sell it today and the value went up, you probably will owe Uncle Sam some money. Talk to an accountant at that time. Okay? But if you owned it for two of the last five years, even if you've been renting it for the last three years, but you owned it two out of the last five years, you can basically take the exemption for capital gain. Another tax benefit when you own property, it's for investment property. People who are going to invest. Many of you may invest in property today, or you're planning on investing in property in the future. There's a 1031 exchange for investment property. That's where the capital gains tax is not avoided, but it's deferred until down the road, until the property is later disposed of. Okay? It's basically, it's going to be deferred down the road. Homeowners can deduct from their gross income certain tax benefits. Okay, they can deduct mortgage interest payments on most first and second homes. So if you own two homes, maybe one here, you live in here in Illinois for six months, and then you go to California for six months. You, if that's your principal residence for six months, you can basically deduct mortgage interest on most first and second homes. Real estate taxes for homeowners are tax deductible on your income tax. Not the interest paid on overdue taxes. No, 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 no. If you didn't pay your real estate taxes and, have to pay, and you have to pay penalties, you cannot deduct those penalties. If the lender charges you loan origination fees to take your loan out, those are tax deductible. Discount points. If the lender charges you discount points, that's basically buying down your loan. Whether you pay them or the seller pays them, 
both you and the seller can deduct them off the taxes. So remember that when you're selling your property, if the buyer wants you to pay discount points, well, they're deductible. Loan prepayment penalties. If the lender charges you a penalty to pay your loan off prior to X amount of years, the penalty you had to pay to the lender will be tax deductible. Home improvements. When homeowners fix up their property for the sale of the property, you can deduct certain expenses, such as in order to sell your property, you have to put in new carpeting, wallpaper, etc. They can be deducted. Or when you bought the property, you had to do certain repairs. They can be. Not for your benefit while you live in there for 10 years, but when you, go to, when you first buy and when you go to sell. Again, you're going to want to talk to your accountant to know the entire list of what can be deducted or not. Then anybody who owns a home should have homeowner's insurance. If you own a home and you have a mortgage loan on it, the lender is going to require mortgage insurance. Okay? But if you own the home free and clear, it's up to you whether you buy homeowner's insurance or if you don't. I'll tell you, many people, when Katrina came around back several years ago, many people who lost their homes during that time were not insured. They owned it free and clear. Think of how much it would it cost to replace everything you have in your home. There's different type of homeowner's insurance policies. Your basic form will provide for property coverage against fire, lightning, burns down, it'll rebuild it, glass breakage, windstorms, hail, explosions, you have an explosion in your house, riots, civil commotion, airplane flies into your house or a car drives into your living room, vandalism, it'll cover your basic policies, loss or removal of property, It'll be covered, okay? So those are your basic. And in today's day and age, you can get an insurance policy for almost anything. Pet insurance, etc., earthquake insurance, termite insurance, whatever, if you want to pay for it. It's up to you or not. There are special apartment condo policies. A tenant renting an apartment, they should have a condo policy, uh, apartment policy. Because the owner's policy is only going to cover the building. It's not going to cover your personal items that you have inside the apartment. Same thing if you own a condominium. The association has insurance policy on the common elements and the building. But if your building burns down, they're going to replace everything up to the paint. And then you have to replace the toilet, the vanities, the carpet, the kitchen cabinets, etc., 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 can get quite costly. Insurance policies, owner basically has to maintain insurance if you have a lender's policy equal to at least 80% of the replacement cost of the dwelling. That will not include the land because why? Land is indestructible. We talked about that. Okay? The insured is only trusted to come up with 20% of the cost out of pocket. You could have higher policies that cover 100% but not necessarily. You need to know about the coinsurance clause that will cover up to 80% of the replacement cost, but does not include the value of the land. So you need to deduct the land value off of that. Another type of insurance policy is your federal flood insurance program. Okay, also known as FEMA. FEMA administers the flood program. It's for owners in flood-prone areas where they have to obtain flood insurance to, when they finance property. Some people think, well, my property is not near any ward or there. I don't need any flood insurance. Oh, that's not true. There's many areas you may not be in water, but you may be in a floodplain. How do you find out? Local communities, local towns, the city, they'll have floodplain maps where you can go and investigate and learn. If the seller has a loan on the property, well, the seller knows if it's in a floodplain because if you buy it today and it's not in a floodplain, and now two years later you get noticed by the lender that it's now in a floodplain, you have such a period of time to get that flood insurance. Otherwise, the lender will put it on for you and charge you back, and they're gonna not going to look for the best price for you. They're gonna not they're not going to watch out for your pocket. 
So should you be aware if your property is in a floodplain, if you own the property free and clear? Most definitely. So that's wrapping up for Chapter 3. This got more into the meats and potatoes. When we get to our next chapter, we're going to be covering even more. Okay, before we go, one thing I want to tell you. Good luck in completing your Modular 1 homework. Make sure you go to On Demand for your test for Modular 1. If you have any questions, please contact me, your instructor, Roseanne. My email address is right there. Email me, call me, leave me a message. I'm here to assist you in studying and helping you out to get through this course. Thank you, and we'll see you very shortly.